our lesson to the poor. Amen. Uh, last week, we saw that our future holds the promise of standing in the direct presence of the glorified Christ. Accordingly, we should work diligently in service to Christ and his gospel to show ourselves worthy of praise and reward. Now, Paul shows us what it means to own the responsibility of being Christ's ambassadors. Today's aim, facts, to grasp the truth that we have been commissioned to be ambassadors for Christ to the world. Principle, to understand what it means to be ambassadors for Christ and our application to live daily in the realization that in everything we do and say, we represent Christ and his gospel to the world. In this lesson, Paul explores our motivation for becoming good ambassadors for Jesus Christ, showing his saving love to a world of lost sinners whom Jesus died to save. Amen. And as we get on into basically our lesson, our scripture text, text, Ambassadors for Christ, one of the sad realities of human relationships is the fact that they often become strained, if not severed. One person offends or hurts another, and the two rarely, if ever, speak to each other again. God has never been faithless to man, but since the fall, man has constantly and continually been unfaithful to men. Sin created a barrier between God and humans that no human being could get past. Without a way to remove that barrier, man would be forever separated from God. But then Jesus Christ entered the picture. In Christ, God took on human form and became a man. Jesus stepped into history as the one and only God-man, fully human and fully divine. No one else is like him. No one will anyone ever be. The mission of Jesus Christ was to reconcile two estranged parties, God and man. Our lesson outline is into three parts. One, ministry of persuasion, for verses 11 through 13, two, ministry of love, for verses 14 through 15, and three, ministry of reconciliation, for verses 17 through 21. And as we like to say, we uh, always want to really give you the depth of our lesson exposition, verse by verse. And that way you'll know exactly what was going on in AD 56, let it relate to this day and time in 2022 in your ministry as we go about doing the Lord's work, doing kingdom work until the trumpet sounds. Amen. So our first uh, topic is ministry of persuasion. And the word of God declares, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Respect for the Lord is our first undertaking for this uh, outline for verse 11. One of the most neglected topics of the current Christian teaching is the fear of the Lord. So many fail to recognize that we serve a God of holiness and power. He is not to be approached in a half-hearted way as though we were just any other person. We are not to take our relationship with the Lord lightly. We should maintain a healthy fear of Him. God is not trying to scare us into loving Him, 
To fear the Lord means to be steadfast and to come to him with a sense of awe and wonder at his power and beauty. It is that proper fear of the Lord that spurs us to go on and try to persuade other people to come to Christ. When we share our faith with others, we should do so in a way that seems to win their hearts, not just give them a list of facts or a bunch of information. The fear of the Lord is what leads people to obedience. Now that's in 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. Without an awareness of who God is, it is natural to try to control our own lives. A healthy fear of the Lord will uh, prevent us from trying to be our own Lord. Knowing that we are made manifest unto God, Father in heaven, that he sees every motivation of our heart should motivate us to live in a way that honors the faith we share with others. Respect for the gospel is our next other topic for verse 12 and 13. Paul did everything he mentioned with a clear conscience and could therefore defend his integrity. Unfortunately, he had many detractors in the Corinthian church. He did extensive work in Corinth, more than almost uh, any other city. It seems he had correspondence with the uh, Corinthians beyond the two letters contained in the Bible. At least two other letters, not to mention personal business. No matter how vigorously he proclaimed and explained the gospel, Paul was always defending his apostolic authority to the Corinthians. Why? Because in order to, uh, for people to learn uh, to listen to our gospel message, we need their respect. Paul was not trying to gain their blessing or approval for his own self-esteem. He had all the confidence he needed from the Lord. However, he wanted the Corinthians to understand that his authority came from Christ. Paul was under steady attack by several opponents, so he worked hard to protect the Corinthians' respect for him. Unlike his detractors, Paul does not ask for respect based on anything superficial but rests his claim on his integrity. The alignment of his actions with his inner conscience or heart. Many Corinthians were impressed with outward appearances and gave uh, little credit to the inner working of the Holy Spirit. To them, Paul lacked the credentials of a gifted uh, orator or philosopher. His message centered around the cross of Jesus, and they thought that to be foolish. Paul wanted them to know, accept, and live by the true gospel of Christ, and not be swayed by outward appearances. Paul's love for this church cannot be questioned. He knew that some people, especially in Corinth, thought that his uh, his, he was a fool and out of his mind. He was content to let people think this way, but he did not uh, want outside opinions of him to uh, undermine the faith of the Corinthian church. Paul might be called a fool by outsiders, but he wanted the church to know that if he was a fool, it was for the Lord. If they could see that he was in his right mind, then it would be to their great benefit. Either way, he was not trying to convince them because he feared man's opinions, but because he wanted people to listen seriously to the gospel message. Ministry of love is our next uh, subject, other topic, and the word declares, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth 
live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. The love of Christ is our first uncovered from this outline. We'll take care of verses 14 and 15. With all the strife that existed between Paul and some of the Corinthians, we might think he was a glutton for punishment. Why would he continue to seek fellowship with people who insulted him, often to the point of rejection? The answer to this question is important as we think of those who may have rejected us for proclaiming the gospel. Paul said that the love of Christ constrained him to persevere in these relationships. To be constrained means to be inwardly compelled to press on in the face of adversity. It was the love of Christ for the Corinthians that compelled Paul to be relentless in his uh, proclamation of the gospel in Corinth. Christians are to be controlled by Jesus' love for us not by our feeble emotions. The difference is that his love is inexhaustible and perfect, while our love has limitations and is imperfect. We are motivated by the love that Jesus has for us and others. Paul and his companions never wavered on the truth. Jesus Christ died for mankind. Jesus paid the penalty for sin on behalf of sinners and everyone who puts their faith in Christ is saved. Now that's Romans 3, 21, 26. Since Jesus died for the Lord, then all who trust in him have died with him. All who believe are now dead to sin. What a remarkable change from being dead in our sins as enemies of God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. Because of Adam, we were dead in sin, uh, but thanks to Jesus, we are now dead to sin. Romans 5, 15. As a result of Christ's resurrection, we are now alive in Him. We died with Him and were raised with Him to new life. Romans 6, 4. Since we are alive in Christ, we are no longer uh, live for ourselves. Our lives are no longer controlled by selfishness and greed, but rather by the Holy Spirit. We now live for Jesus, the one who gave us life. Jesus died and rose again for our sake, not for his own. He did not have to die because he had never committed any sin or any kind. Hebrews 4.15 1 Peter 2.22. He died willingly as an act of mercy toward us. Therefore, we do not live for him simply because of our love for him, but because of his love for us. A change in perspective is our next under topic for verse 16. Once Paul gained this knowledge, he changed the way he did the even those who vehemently opposed him. The words wherefore henceforth mean so from now on and indicate that a definite change had taken place in Paul's thinking. He no longer saw people the way he once did when he was persecuting the church. He now saw people through the eyes of Jesus as it was Jesus' love that controlled him. Paul had determined that he would no longer see people through the eyes of the flesh, but would see them as human souls in need of redemption. Since we are motivated, uh, it, is a, it is important for us to do the same. Since we are motivated by Christ's love for us, we are no longer, we no longer look at people according to the world's standards of success. We see that their need for Jesus is just as great as ours and we view them with mercy and compassion. Yeah. Ministry 
Ministry of Reconciliation is our next uh, topic for our uh, outline. And the Word of God declares, Therefore, if a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses uh, unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did uh, beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, but be uh, reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made his righteousness of God in him. New creation is our first time to talk for this great outline for books of 17. This great news of for the believer is that once we come to Christ, our past sins are erased. And we are made new. Trusting Christ means our trespasses are forgotten. God removes the sin from the sinner and sets the sinner free. His sin has been removed from him as far as the east is from the west. Now you can find that in Psalms 103 and 12. The blood of Jesus is the ultimately and infinitely powerful stain remover. When Christ took our sins away, he left no trace of them behind. God no longer sees us as sinners, but as his children. There is no way we can continue in our old lives, for we have been made new. Our old self has passed away, and the new has come. Amen. The newness of life we have in Christ far surpasses in greatness and glory anything we ever did for ourselves. The power of sin has no dominion over us any longer. Because Jesus has made sense, has set us free. Knowing this, it does not make sense that we would feel free to keep on sinning. Why would Jesus set us free from sin just to have us, just to have us run back to it? Sin kept us in bondage. And Jesus broke the chains and let us go. We are not free to sin, but instead, we are free from sin. We do not live in bondage anymore. Reconciliation is our next topic for verse, uh, verses 18 and 19. The work of salvation belongs to God and God alone. We did not do anything to contribute to our salvation whatsoever. Salvation is the gift of God that was purchased on the cross by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2, 89. Because of the barrier between man and God that was caused by our sin, there was no way for us to get back to God. No amount of pleading or working would do anything to make us right with the Lord. The only way uh, for the barrier to be removed is if God and removed it himself. And that is precisely what Jesus came and did. God reconciled the world back to himself through Jesus Christ, his son. The barrier between God and man was uniquely signified by the thick curtain uh, uniquely that hung in the Holy of Holies in the temple. This curtain prevented man from coming into the presence of God. Through what Jesus did on the cross, however, 
the curtain was torn in half. Through the work of Jesus, we have been reconciled with God and can now freely enter into his presence. Once we repent and place our faith in Jesus, our sins are never held against us. That's from Jeremiah 31, 34, Hebrews 10, 17. But there is a responsibility for those who have experienced reconciliation with God. We are now charged by the same Spirit who charged Paul to take the message of reconciliation to the world so that others can have the same forgiveness we now enjoy. We do not have the right to keep this message to ourselves. To keep the gospel to ourselves while our people enter eternity in hell is the embodiment of selfishness. Sharing the message is not a condition of being saved, but those who are saved should see it not only as an obligation, but as a privilege. Ambassadors of Christ is our next under topic for verse 20. All Christians are called into the ministry. We may have specific callings within ministry, but we are all called and appointed to share the gospel of Jesus and tell people that God has reconciled the world back to himself through Jesus Christ. Not through Muhammad or Buddha or the Dalai Lama or any of the false gods of the world's polytheistic religions, but through Jesus Christ alone. Being proclaimers of the message of reconciliation makes us ambassadors for Christ. Ambassador is an official representative of a government to a foreign nation. He's not representing his own interests, but the interests of the one who sits him. As ambassadors of Christ, we represent the interests of God and proclaim his message, which is for the salvation of man. God has not called us to be motivational speakers, but ambassadors. God has declared a peace treaty because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. And it is up to his ambassadors to go out and make known the terms of this truth. 